Magnum Photos was founded in New York in 1947 by four photographers. George Roger, David Seymour, known as Jim, Henri Cartier-Bresson, and Robert Capper, whom everyone just called Bob. It was he who had the idea of forming an agency. Hi, welcome back. Magnum Photos has built up a powerful brand over the past 77 years. But during that time, the members have had to face crisis after crisis. In order to survive, they've had to adapt their approach. During the past decade, the agency's major competitors, Gamma, Sigma and Sipa, have all fought bankruptcy. Seven Photo Agency has also changed its business structure in order to remain viable. The way that the world consumes media has transformed radically. Photographic storytelling has lost the battle to video, and social media, as we know, is geared towards the quick and impactful. So finding outlets to in-depth work has become increasingly difficult. I remember when I was starting out as a photographer, Magnum represented the pinnacle of the photojournalistic world. If one made it into Magnum, then one had truly made it. You know, still I notice when people ask me how I work, and I say, well, I'm the cooperative called Magnum. They say, oh, Magnum. The agency was founded in 1947, just after the Second World War. They got the name Magnum from the large bottles of wine that they would drink at each meeting. Cartier-Bresson wrote that their mission as photographers was to create lasting impressions of fleeting moments. He would never describe his photographs as art, but said that as photographers they should aspire to create poetry of life's reality. Basically, I really do think, we, I mean, we all obviously photograph in very different ways, we come from very different backgrounds, but I think of all the, in all the photographers there is this such a of a certain quality. I think there is, a, there is a respect for reality, there's a respect for people, and uh, there's a respect for the, the photograph, and I think this is, this is something very important. From the very beginning, there was a, essentially a, very, a core of shared beliefs about photography, and it came from Bob, it came from Henri, uh, Henri was adamant that there should be no artificiality and no cropping and that you have to react spontaneously and that there was a, that, that this was a kind of high calling and it was a, that we were morally obligated to do the best we could to tell people what it was like. Robert Kappa had created his iconic picture of the falling soldier before Magnum was formed during the Spanish Civil War. Eighteen years later, he too was killed in a landmine in the first Indochina war. The founders of Magnum came up with a single-use policy, and this was a watershed moment for the photographers. They gained independence because they now had control over their income. It allowed them to retain copyright and to sell to multiple users. This didn't just benefit Magnum photographers. It became the standard within the industry and opened the space for freelancers. The genius thing of Magnum was, and I presume it was Carper's basic idea, was, was the right from the beginning demanded that the, that the photographers owned the copyright. That was never there before. And so Magnum was really, the idea of Magnum was, you know, you had four great photographers who undoubtedly could make a living, etc. But as a group decided that they could do things more thoroughly, better, with more integrity, if they could spend more time on the thing. And the only way to spend more time on the thing was to demand that the work that you did was your work and that other people were simply buying the use of your work. That meant you could go and spend six months somewhere, and when you came back, 
you could sell it to 15 places rather than one place. He had been gone through the Second World War, and he'd gone through Spain before that and his other combat experience, and he was always working for editors. And ed editors, picture editors, think they understand photography, but they really don't. Some of them did, but a lot of them didn't. And he, it was very annoying. You would go out and cover the war, and people would send you telegrams from an office in New York about what you should do. And he felt that photographers should be able to determine their own fate and should take care of themselves and not be dependent on magazines. During the 50s and 60s, many of the Magnum photographers focused on reportage. This was the heyday of the picture story publications like Life and Look. Others within the agency started to respond to the new media demands. Eve Arnold, the collective's first female member, and Elliot Erwitt satisfied the growing need for pictures of celebrities. In the early 70s, Life magazine closed and abruptly the golden age of photojournalism came to an end. Without photo-driven magazines to commission their work, Magnum photographers had to look about for new publications that sought out quality work. Steve McCurry's Afghan Girl made it onto the cover of National Geographic in 1985. While more recently, Vice magazine has teamed up with Magnum to showcase social documentary and feature work. They continue to recruit the best of the best, but some prominent members like James Nachtwey left the collective. Eugene Richards joined, left, joined again and left again. Magnum has taken a few body blows during the past decade. COVID hit all freelance photographers in a big way. Steve McCurry became embroiled in a Photoshop controversy. David Allen Harvey was accused of a number of cases of sexual misconduct. And there were allegations that the agency was selling photographs of sexually exploited minors on their website, including images from a series taken by Harvey in Bangkok. Martin Parr also became the focus of another controversial incident in 2019 which I discussed in my video on his work. Pa made it into the agency on a marginal vote in 1994, and Henry Cartier-Bresson's response was that he thought that the two of them were from different solar systems. It took me a long time to become a member of Magnum because uh, many Magnum photographers didn't want me to join, so therefore I had to go through some meetings where I was rejected and it's always been a close thing that I would get enough votes to become a member. And, um, you know, but I knew that it was the right thing for me to join because I wanted to get, you know, strong distribution of the work. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a populist at heart and I thought that Magnum was able to offer the best means of distribution for my pictures. The objections to me being a member was that uh, I was too cynical and not fitting into the tradition of humanism that Magnum is famous for. The agency has been under attack for being too male and too white. When Magnum announced that it supported the Black Lives Matter movement, it was accused of hypocrisy because it only had so few black members. The agency began to explore new possible approaches and directions. In 2018, they collaborated with the new school, which is situated in New York. To empty our institutions, to start again, not just to counter them, but to create an anti-institution. It said, I want an institution, a museum, a gallery, or whatever, that doesn't reproduce white supremacy, that doesn't represent a prison in which there isn't expropriated labor, there isn't extinction, and there isn't genocide. What would that look like? Can we really think about photography to be decolonized, just as a prompt, and can we think about that together? Especially when we know photography is a colonial tool, um, and it's impossible to escape. Um, so at the same time, what can we do? And right, you know, what can institutions look like? What can museums look like? What can photography look like? And in that context, what do we mean by what would be decolonial space within photography? 
So intersectionality, we should have a conversation. Though Magnum's membership is still majority men, its executive ranks are now majority women. Caitlin Hughes, Magnum's CEO, placed diversity at the top of the agenda. And at the 2020 annual general meeting, the members voted to pursue a route of affirmative action to assure diversity. Not all of the members were in agreement with this decision. Chris Steele Perkins, Magnum's first member of colour, raised concerns that this approach might run the risk of being tokenistic and becoming a box-ticking exercise. He said you want people to come into Magnum on the same terms you've applied historically, but from a wider variety of backgrounds. There's always been a very rigorous four-year application process, and he wants that selection model to remain in place. I think that the kind of photographers that we need in the future are really people who, who are doing cutting edge. One of the depressing things about the, the things that we have seen, the portfolios that were submitted to us, is that I feel this is, this is mediocre work, basically. One of the major markets that Magnum wants to pursue is the art world. They've added more art-orientated photographers like Jim Goldberg, Raphael Milach, Michael Sabotsky, and in a different way, Antoine Diagada. They opened the Magnum Paris Gallery in 2021 in the hope of exploiting the lucrative market of collectible photography. The addition of softer, more personally focused photography might also appeal to art collectors. The agency has nearly 2 million followers on Instagram, Twitter and Facebook and during the last $200 print sale campaigns they made over $800,000. Because the Magnum brand is so strong they also want to expand their workshop program and start selling labelled merchandise. Perhaps you will be able to buy your luggage, clothes or watches with a Magnum Photos logo. Magnum has always been owned by the photographers within the collective, but because they haven't managed to become financially stable for many years, they've affiliated with investors to form the Magnum Global Ventures subsidiary. This move wasn't universally endorsed by all members. John Vink resigned from the agency because he couldn't comply with the new rules and obligations. In a world in which there are now literally billions of cameras, an agency like Magnum just can't survive while merely producing good or even very good work. I think it's important for photography as a whole that Magnum finds a way to remain financially viable while simultaneously maintaining its standard of excellence. Thanks for joining me and I'll see you next time. The future of Magnum I think is I think it's very good because I think it believes in honesty and integrity and, and, and things like that. And I, I don't, I hope, God, I hope and pray that those things don't become dirty words. Um, I sometimes doubt that. I, you know, when I look at what newspapers do now and say now, etc., it seems to me they couldn't care a damn about these kind of things. But what they want to do is sell copies. We are those old-fashioned people that say we are observers of things. Magnum is, for better or worse, the result of a number of people getting together saying, we believe in something, which is to record the human condition as compassionately as we can. But essentially, the common denominator is a concern with the outside world, not your navel, or what goes on inside your brain when you've not had enough something, right? It's the outside world. That's who we are. We can't be in the same state of mind than they were 50 years ago. They were leaving their homes and going away, traveling, discovering the world and showing this world to to the people and now you know the world is known uh, there is not so many things to discover anyway anymore and uh, 
uh, the photography has not the same function that it has before.